Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining the conversation tonight. Uh, my name is Kelsey McBride. I am the outreach director for the Monty for Mayor campaign. And one of the things that I've really enjoyed most about all this is getting to know individuals and groups that are doing really, really important work here in Chattanooga. And I know that that work has been going on for many years. It will continue to go on after this election, but um, it seems that with every election cycle, we get the chance to evaluate how we're doing as a city. Uh, what can we improve upon? And we have the power to elect or reelect individuals that align with our values and our priorities. Uh, so for me, I am in a, I'm a lesbian in Chattanooga. I have a wonderful partner and I am so happy that I get to to be in this city that we both love and to experience all the great things that Chattanooga has to offer. But I realize that there are still a lot of groups within the LBGTQ community that are marginalized and their rights are being threatened every single day. Uh, so what I wanted to do by joining this conversation is to talk about where we are as a city, what are we facing at the state level? What are some challenges that we're being presented with? And to talk about the solutions, because we have heard for way too long all of the things that are going wrong. But I do want to focus on some real meaningful changes that we can bring about to protect and further advance the welfare of all LGBTQ community members and not just some of them, right? Um, so thank you all for being here. This is really important to me and I know that it's important to all of us that are on here. Uh, tonight you'll hear from three women, Evelina Curte, Ginger Moss, and Anna Galladay, uh, who are all doing very important work here and they have a lot of great things to share with you. So without further ado, we're gonna start out with Evelina. How are you doing? I am pretty good. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, Evelina grew up here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. She's a student at UTC majoring in political science with a focus in public policy. Uh, Evelina cur currently serves as the vice president for the UTC Young Democratic Socialists of America and the labor policy packager for the Democratic Democracy Policy Network. Ooh, that was a mouthful. How do you have time for all that? <laughs> um, it's, just, I guess you just find it. It's um, just, turns out there's actually a lot of time in the day. Just, you got to find what it is. That's right. That's right. So my first question for you is, given the state where we are nationally with the new Biden administration, with certain things being uh, progressed, are you hopeful that LGBTQ protections will take effect at the federal level? And can you explain why those policy enforcements are so critical to every city everywhere? I, I think that there definitely are things that are promising. For instance, uh, Biden's housing administration just released, I think yesterday that they do plan on enforcing uh, basically protections um, for discrimination, basically in the, they're interpreting sex as including sexual orientation, gender identity, and enforcing that in, under the Fair Housing Code. Um, I don't think, but that has, that's sort of going to probably have to go to court. Um, there's definitely things promising that like that. Um, I don't think we can rely on it or that, or that federal change just because I don't think Biden's a particularly dedicated ally at all, and I and I think that could be overturned rather easily, especially if the like, Congress is lost or you know the different president. Um, I um, and you, you think about like even if there was like protections theoretically against discrimination, in the exact term like Af technically legal to discriminate against African Americans, like you can't like not hire them for the race, but there's still definitely discrimination because those rules aren't well well enforced, and people can just make excuses to fire those people. So I, I think that we're not really going to see as much change in, until it comes from the local level. That's a very good point. So um, my next question is, in the 2020 general election, 
uh, voters elected six transgender candidates to state office. While this is a victory for the LGBTQ community, can you talk a little more about the difference between representation materially and also the policy changes that would bring about real change? Yeah, I think it's definitely something hopeful that we were getting trans people elected and um it's good to see you know that means a lot to a lot of people including me um and i never mean to discount the value of representation um i i do think that that can be weaponized into in, in sometimes into pushing forward policies that are not very helpful for instance um we like it's not exactly on lgp issues but there are definitely Say we appointed um, a Hispanic person to uh, chair of Homeland Security, but they're still going to put put forward policies that are deeply harmful to people of color. And so uh, I think that it's definitely a victory to get this representation, but it's not a replacement for policy and material change. And we should be skeptical of people really trouting out representation without backing it up. That's a very good point. You put that beautifully. So next question, I would like to uh, have you share with us the the gay panic and trans panic defenses are still legal in the Tennessee court system. For those of us that maybe aren't familiar with those, could you tell us what those are and why they are so they are so contributing to violence against the LGBTQ community? Um, basically, it's a legal defense strategy that justifies violence against LGBT people, basically because basically they got freaked out, uh, like well, straight men normally, they got basically grossed out because they like started kissing a trans person and didn't know they were trans or something like that. And basically, it, it basically they, they basically they argue that basically they became so disgusted by people's bodies that they had they were in a point of insanity and that, that then it becomes legal to kill those people because they were not in their right mind it's a legal defense strategy um some states have specifically banned it we're definitely not one of those states so that is a legal defense strategy and i believe it has been used a couple times in court and so it it definitely justifies um violence LGBT people as sort of normalized yeah, we have a lot to a lot of work to do there for sure. You're a student at UTC. You're a trans woman. UTC claims to be one of the more progressive institutions in the state of Tennessee. Um, Everlina, would you agree with that statement, or can you talk a little more about why maybe they have not come out in support? of the protection of LGBTQ members' rights at the university and within Chattanooga as a whole. I definitely don't want to downplay that it's being at UGC is a lot better experience than being at other schools. For instance, MTSU is a lot worse, or like maybe some of the other schools in Memphis maybe a lot worse. Um, definitely there are some good things, mostly that there's a larger LGBT community within the school, though I give a lot of credit that to Spectrum Spectrum UTC rather than the administration. Um, there's definitely some things like, uh, uh, for instance, trans women are still not allowed in women's housing and trans men are not allowed in men's housing, uh, just because we don't, it's not, there's, it's comp- the official policy at least just completely rejects the ability of, to recognize trans people and such is based on birth certificate and in Tennessee, at least in your born Tennessee, you can't change your birth certificate as a trans person ever. Um, so there are, so theoretically, if you're born someone else, uh, you might be able to use that to prove, you might be able to use that as your birth certificate from somewhere else to get access. But in, for people born in Tennessee, Tennessee natives, that means at UTC, you can't get access to the dorms you belong in. Um, and for why that happens, it's pretty simple. Uh, there's a lot of conservative donors for UTC in the Alumni Association, one of them being Kim White um, and other large conservatives, and they're afraid of alienating those donors. I, it's pretty simple. Right. It is simple. It is simple. Um, money over humans, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, along kind of those those same lines, your views on the Chattanooga Police Department. 
Have you had any encounters with the CPD? Uh, do you think that there's transphobia that exists within the police department here in our city? And what are some things that we can do to change that if that is the case? Um, well, I definitely, I've, I've never been directly arrested. I've definitely have interactions with the police. For instance, a lot of at a lot of protests, I've had negative encounters with them. Uh, and I would say there's almost definitely a lot of transphobia institutionalized in the C police department. I know, for instance, uh, one of our member uh, there was uh, Elena Cobb when they were arrested uh, a couple of years back at the start of March. They will instead of being given a proper room in a, a jail cell, they were handcuffed overnight to a chair in the waiting room because um and definitely um they uh statistics to show i don't there's not statistics for police, police department statistics to show that uh police are about twice to three times as likely to use violence when arresting out trans people as compared to cis populations um there was and often there's often issues where they uh strip search trans people to humiliate them um, particularly ones that, that piss the, pissed them off in some way. Um, so yeah, I would, de- uh, I don't know the statistics, particularly with CPD, but I told uh, the negative stories, um, you know, especially if people like saying being followed by a police, say, um, on a UGC campus because they were trans, they thought like, the person that thought the police thought they looked suspicious. Um, I, what we can do about it, um, I think one of the first things we can do is support CCN and the police oversight board and it for a proper police oversight board with subpoena powers. Um, those, those are, that's run by some great, really great groups that um, I believe would help support LGBT issues. Um, things like um, tech training for police officers about LGBT issues could be helpful. I'm a little skeptical about what police training can actually do when this whole system of policing has some deeply entrenched biases. Um, but I definitely think that a police oversight board would be the best place to start, at least. Um, also, having official policies supporting trans women and trans men in all prisons and uh, at the county level and the county jail. Right. Right. Those are all great suggestions. And then to wrap up this conversation, what about when our newly elected mayor gets into office and new city council members are appointed and elected? What are some actions in a way that they can take to make Chattanooga a safer, more equitable place for our community? Yeah, um, so there's a couple of things they can do. Um, I'm not exactly familiar with what the mayor can do themselves, how powerful mayoral executive actions are. So some of this may involve city council, some of it not. Some of them really you could do rather quickly if you're able to pass it would be uh, to um, create non-discrimination ordinance for the selection of city contracts, which we don't have, um, uh, ban conversion therapy within city limits, which is still legal. Um, I don't know if we have any conversion therapy um, operations, but it definitely would be good to ban them anyway. Uh, ban discrimination in public inco- accommodations on the basis of sex, sexual orientation. Uh, possibly ban any sort of like walking while trans laws that um, uh, deport uh, trans people. Uh, uh, refusing to, to uh, enforce a sex work laws that um, trans people are disproportionately sex workers. Um, expand city employee benefits to non-married domestic partners. Um, and then uh, you could use your power over contracts to basically, uh, we will only do, we will only create contracts with companies that have strict non-discrimination ordinances. And if they provide healthcare, provide healthcare to trans people. Some of the longer term policies that would be really helpful would be providing services for LGBT youth, LGBT youth experiencing homelessness, um, having a human rights commission within the Chinese teams as some larger cities has with enforcement powers, um, uh, passing a full non-discrimination ordinance for private businesses and housing that would require going to suit against the state, which, but I think, um, that would be worth it. And Monty has said as such. Um, and yeah, I think, and just like also services for LGBT elders and adults are often get, have discrimination in um, sort of private nursing homes and things like that, um, and violence against them. And then, uh, as I said, police oversight on LGBT discrimination cases. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Evelina. I really appreciate your time with us today. Those are wonderful, wonderful feedback um, that we can all put in. You know, we've got to really bring these to the the people, right? I mean, we've got to get this out there. We've got to raise awareness of the issues that continue to go on and especially get in front of our elected officials. So thank you so much. Yeah. Um, we are going to go ahead and talk to Ginger Moss. Uh, Ginger is an LGBTQ activist. Um, she's lived in Chattanooga for almost 20 years now, and um, she is one of the most uh, influential, active policy shifting forces that we have here in Chattanooga. So I'm excited to talk with you today, Ginger. Thank um, you for having me. So my first question would be, yes, yes. How are you doing? Good, good. Good. So my first question for you, Ginger, what are the biggest issues that are currently facing the LGBTQIA community here in Chattanooga? Um, so many of our LGBTQIA folks are not visible. Our own community never sees them because they're literally dying to live. They're struggling with housing and employment and the most basic needs that we, the rest of us that are visible, have to speak up for them, have to fight for them every day, which Evelina is doing. And thank you for that, Evelina. And mm -hmm. I want to uh, put a stamp on everything she talked about. A lot of the work I do and a lot of the work Marcus, who's on here with us, does intersects with what Evelina is doing. I'm on the contro Community Control Now uh, initiative to try and get that oversight board. I helped author uh, an equality ordinance to try and extend it to the citizens of Chattanooga. Marcus was very instrumental in that and will continue to be hopefully. Um, <clears throat> so it's our basic needs that are still not guaranteed in this city. A lot of people assume because of the Supreme Court case that gave us same-sex marriage that we were then equal to everyone else. And no matter how many court cases and decisions we have, it's simply patchwork rights that we have this much when everyone else has what the, most citizens are guaranteed. So there are a lot of people within our own community that don't even realize they don't have the same rights as everyone else. So I say we start and we need to just blanket cover all LGBTQIA people in this city right now to make a better Chattanooga. Excellent. Yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. Now, you spent years working on this legislation. Can yeah. you talk can you talk about what that process looked like? What was your strategy and ultimately what was the outcome? We worked with the city council as closely as we could. We spent over three years, me personally, going down there to all the committee meetings, every Tuesday night attending those meetings, having back hallway discussions with each of them, trying to put a face to the issues. Those that I learned needed statistics, we gave them statistics. Those that needed personal stories, we gave them personal stories. Those that had never really encountered this discussion before, we just wanted to give them just the faces and the stories to go with it because so often the disability community and the queer community are simply left out of the discussions when it comes to policy. Um, we faced, quite frankly, a lot of discrimination. And you would think with a council that is made up of some minorities, it was in fact those minorities that threw the most offensive conversations um, that we faced a lot of resistance from. We knew there were conservative members and I even went over one of the conservative members. Uh, but it, it, it took them getting used to seeing me and knowing and just literally being relentless to get them to be willing to discuss it. We found sponsors and co-sponsors and supporters. And eventually I had every council member willing to sign on to this. The mayor's office acted like they were going to support it. And in the committee meeting where the council and the city attorney wanted to know what the mayor's current mayor's pleasure was when it came to this subject, he said, we don't wanna get into a legal battle with the state. Because as everyone's aware, there is a preemption bill 
in the state of Tennessee that was enacted in 2011 that prevents municipalities from extending protections to LGBTQIA individuals. The city could have passed it anyway. If the state had come down on us, there are enough positive federal circuit court decisions that we believe we could have had it over, overturned and literally overturned all state sanctioned discrimination. We could have stopped it in its tracks, but it was the mayor's office that stopped it. Monty has agreed to sign on that he will take this on with us and in his words, help spank the state on preemption bills. <laughs> so we want to help him do that. Wonderful. Yeah, that's that's one of the many reasons I support Monty is his willingness and his commitment to do that and to fight for for all of us. Um, is that is that playing a role in your decision to try and get this bill passed again? Are you waiting to see what happens with the mayoral and the city council new elections? Yes. Uh, well, number one, because uh, they did pass a resolution, we had to wait a full uh, city council year to present it again and wanted to wait uh, on a couple of things. We wanted to see if the current presidential administration was going to pass sweeping legislation in the form of a constitutional amendment to protect us, uh, which he has now said he won't be able to do in his first 100 days. And if he doesn't get it in the first year and we hit the midterm elections, we probably will not see it in my lifetime because I'm almost 60 years old. We will not get that window again. I wanted to see what was happening in the state elections, whether uh, Glenn Scruggs was going to be successful in unseating, um, well, a homophobe and a transphobe um, and someone who was responsible for a lot of the conservative agenda against us. And I wanted to see who was going to be seated in the mayor's office at City Hall and City Council. This is new faces. I have to start those relationships all over again with some new folks. Uh, but I've been working on all of the candidates already for the past year, um, trying trying to get them on board with this. And I believe if um, Monty gets gets in and the candidates uh, that have signed on get in, we will we will get this passed. We will do it again. I'm very hopeful that that happens for sure. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the role of young people is in this fight? I mean. I, I think you made the comment, it's ready for, you're ready to pass on the torch to the next generation. Do you see a lot more engagement by the young people? I mean, has that been a positive, are, are we doing that right in Chattanooga? Are young people getting involved to help this cause? Definitely. And I'm so thankful for their energy uh, and for their willingness to get out there and fight every day. Uh, we really saw it when Trump got into office very very quickly, so many people were terrified of what was about to happen. And in fact, what did happen in this country in regards to LGBTQIA folks, specifically what um, was thrown at our transgender family members. So that brought a lot of, a lot of people out into the community. And then again, a lot of people came out in our, our uprising this summer. So there are even more people activated and we have to keep them activated. Um, and one of the really neat things that has been happening over the last three plus years that I've, I've been working on this is for the first time, we're building alliances and coalitions outside of the queer community. So I'm working on con community control now, which is a coalition of many organizations. And I believe if we start this effort up all over again, we'll be able to use those member organizations and the organizations that are involved in Caleb and other activist groups here to help propel us forward that we won't be fighting it alone this time. All right, looks like we lost our moderator for a moment. She was having internet issues earlier due to some of the outages going on in town with uh, EPB. And so um, one of the other things she wanted to ask was, um, what are some of the positive things going on in the city regarding LGBTQ? Um, how has the city changed since I've been here? 
So I was telling her uh, in a conversation earlier that when I moved here 20 years ago, because I'm a white cisgendered person, I always felt safe walking around downtown holding hands with my partner uh, and it being obvious that I was same sex partnered. Um, that was never an issue as long as I was in downtown uh, that other queer people have not had that same experience. Uh, particularly our trans people, black trans people, trans people of color, especially our, our indigenous folks. We have a lot of indigenous folks um, in Chattanooga and in the surrounding areas. And what changed uh, was multifold. The city attracted a lot of young urban professionals that are more open minded and that they're shocked when they moved to this this city to discover there aren't protections here and that most corporations do not provide even the most basic domestic partnership and don't have policies protecting us and maybe not even cover us in their insurance. Um, so they're very, very shocked at that. But one of the other things uh, that happened was when um, Trump got into office that was when people started side-eyeing me for the first time, uh, even downtown. Uh, they became more emboldened, uh, threw things at us at the gas station and, and things of that nature. So I believe that, um, you know, the city is surrounded by still a, a lot of uh, rednecks, people that very proudly carry the Confederate flag and the whole uh, hate agenda. And they became more emboldened during the last four years. And it became a very frightening time for the young people that did come out. That's what they talked about was for the first time they were fearing for their, their lives that they had not felt that even the year before. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to, um, give them some safety, give them some security. And that is my mission, uh, is, is to, to try and make that happen. Wonderful. Am I back? Can you see yes. me and hear me okay? Okay, yes. wonderful. Thanks for, for taking the mic there. Um, I do also want to, we have two minutes left, and I want to invite Anna to take the mic um, and share with us a little bit about your experience as a faith leader within Chattanooga. Um, and also your your activist work on behalf of the LGBTQIA community and what happened in 2018, if you would share with us a little bit about that, Anna. Hi guys, can you hear me? Okay, um, uh, it's been a day of technical difficulties, hasn't it? <laughs> um, so yeah, I, in 2018, I so I'm a United Methodist pastor. United Methodist pastor. I am. Uh, I was removed from my pastoral um, appointments in 2018 because my bishop, who resides in Knoxville, found out that I had um, presided over a same gender wedding. The, um, the impact of that is that, you know, I lost my livelihood, but um, it, it was not um, something that I ever thought twice about or wouldn't do again if I, if I had the opportunity to. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges, as Ginger mentioned, that, we're, that we've seen here in Chattanooga is, you know, with the rise of white culture, we've also seen a rise or an assertion by those who claim to be evangelical Christians that there's a rightness in their um, theology. There's a rightness in, in the, the ways in which they're um, attacking our queer kin. I have the privilege of white, cis, straight um, advocate in the work. Um, I, I actually don't use the word ally anymore. Um, I use the word accomplice. Um, because quite frankly, if I'm not prepared to be hit, if I'm, if I'm not standing close enough to my queer kin to be hit with the same stones that people are throwing them, then I'm not deep enough into the work. And so um, 